Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar launch for NCAI's Oneida Nation Food Sovereignty Case Study. My name is Sadie Redigal. I'm an enrolled member of the Okta Missouri Tribe of Indians, and I serve as a research associate here at NCAI. Before we get into today's welcoming, I just wanted to provide a small housekeeping note for today's webinar. So because we are running on a one hour agenda, we'll be asking attendees to use the, utilize the chat box function um, for submitting questions. If you have a question for a particular panelist, please identify that person when submitting. If your question is for all, please just say all. And lastly, if we don't get to your question today, or if you have any follow-up questions, please, be, please feel free to email us at foodsovereignty at ncii.org. And with that, I'll pass it on over to Ian Record to open us up. Ian, please take it away. Uh, thank you so much, Sadie. So welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for this uh, webinar that launches the second in a series of five uh, case studies that NCAI is developing in partnership with tribal nations that document leading uh, tribal food sovereignty approaches across Indian country. As the slide shows, my, uh, my uh, position is Vice President of uh, Tribal Governance and Special Projects. Um, the Special Projects part of that includes um, the Tribal Food Sovereignty Advancement Initiative that NCAI launched uh, back in 2018. I uh, wanted to briefly uh, take you through some of the other things that we either have done or will be doing uh, to give you a sense of how uh, NCAI is, is adding value to uh, this field of, uh, of folks, organizations, uh, supporting, informing, um, and, and advising uh, and documenting uh, the, the tribal food sovereignty, food production, and food security efforts of tribal nations across Indian country. So, You'll notice here we uh, four symposiums. Uh, this past uh, spring and summer of 2020, uh, we held four uh, policy, policy symposiums that looked at the nexus between food sovereignty and then agriculture, land, water, and climate action. And out of that, we um, have developed uh, two policy resources, the first of which is our uh, farm bill uh, policy brief that we developed in conjunction with uh, several organizational partners. Uh, this this uh, farm bill brief looks at um, the state of implementation of the tribal provisions that were contained in the 2018 farm bill. And then it also looks forward to the 2023 farm bill and begins to articulate what the overarching priorities of Indian country are for that uh, updating of this incredibly important piece of legislation in Indian country. Um, we also will be funneling a lot of the what was shared by participants in those symposiums into a, a comprehensive policy brief that we'll be releasing at NCAI's uh, Executive Council Winter Session event in late February of this year. Um, we also have our five case studies. Uh, in 2019, we released our case study on the uh, Yurok tribe. Um, and then today we're launching our second case study uh, of the Oneida Nation in Wisconsin. And then in the next uh, month and a half or so, we're going to be releasing our final three uh, case studies, and we'll be doing webinars for each of those. And those uh, tribes are uh, the San Carlos Apache tribe, the Osage Nation, and the Blackfeet Nation in Montana. Uh, and then last but certainly not least, we uh, just in the last couple of weeks released our Tribal Food Sovereignty and Food Production uh, Resource Directory. Uh, which features more than 130 programmatic entries um, that sh uh, show uh, tribal nations and individual native food producers where they can go find sources of support, uh, both financial and other types of support, such as technical assistance, scholarships, et cetera, uh, to support their food sovereignty and food production efforts. Uh, we'll be sharing that, the link to that document as well through, oh, she's right on top of it there. There's the link to the uh, Food Sovereignty Resource Directory. And then the Tribal Food Sovereignty Advancement Initiative over the next uh, year or so, uh, we'll be working on developing an interactive online resource center um, that shares um, tribal best practices from across Indian country uh, when it comes to the, the issue of food sovereignty, specifically looking at the role of tribal governments um, and, and what can tribal governments do working 
um, internally working in partnership with others across the community and outside of the community to uh, develop tribally uh, self-determined approaches to uh, reclaiming, rejuvenating, revitalizing, and, and creating sustainable food systems uh, for their communities and their citizens. Next slide. So without further ado, I wanted to introduce our panelists uh, with us today to help us launch um, the case study uh, of the United Nations Food Sovereignty Approach, our three representatives of the nation. Uh, we have Chairman Hill, uh, who serves as chairman of the United Nations uh, Business Committee. Uh, we have Vanessa Miller, uh, who serves as public, self, public health sanitarian uh, in the Environmental Health, Safety, and Agriculture Division uh, with the nation. And then we have uh, Jesse Padron, uh, Food Service Director with the United Nations School District. And all of them are involved in some form or fashion in the um, integrated initiative that Oneida has developed and refined over the past uh, few decades. And they're going to be sharing their, their perspectives and their roles and their, their outlook on this initiative uh, with us here today. And we're very honored to have them with us. And so without further ado, I wanted to turn the floor over to Chairman Hill uh, to kick us off. And, and Chairman, uh, you know, obviously you're, you're looking at this from a leadership standpoint and, and doing what you can as a, as a leader of your tribe to support and help grow this initiative over time. So can you, from your perspective, just provide us an overarching uh, summary of of what this initiative involves, how the nation came about to develop it, and and how you see it benefiting your people. Yeah, definitely. Suguli uh, Swagwake, greetings everyone. I am excited to be here today to share with you Oneida Nation's initiatives on food sovereignty. Our reservation is located near Green Bay, Wisconsin. Our total membership worldwide is about 17,000 members with just over 4,400 Oneida is living on or near the reservation. Our reservation is approximately 65,400 acres, and we currently own about 27,600 of those acres. Our ability to produce, process, distribute, and educate about healthy foods, including our traditional foods, to our community is one of our top priorities. Next slide, please. Our strategy for building a healthy community relies on these five approaches. Number one, building a community mindset for healthy food. Number two, ensuring sustainable development and practices. Number three, increase our local agriculture and food production. Number four, build local food economies. And number five, integrate local foods into our community outlets to increase community access. Next slide, please. The United people have always been farmers, cultivating the land and creating sustainable foods since the beginning of time. At the core of our food sovereignty model lies what are known by the Oneida people as the three sisters, the corn, beans, and squash. They were given to us by the creator for the sake of keeping our communities healthy with food that is from Mother Earth and has been made to replenish our bodies. Growing the three sisters as a unit provides a strong nucleus for food sustenance, given the natural relationship between them. From this traditional teaching, the nation began moving into an integrated food system model, whereby our goal is to connect the community assets, activities, events, and initiatives, all while incorporating our culture with the goal of building a healthier community. Next, we'll cover the production, processing, and distribution of the products. Next slide, please. Under the production category, we have an aquaponics facility. Our aquaponics was developed in 2016 through a grant award by the USDA as a farm to school project aimed at providing healthy greens for the United Nations school system and for experiential learning. Next slide, please. Another production component is the Oneida Nation farms and is the largest privately owned black Angus herd in Wisconsin. There are over 400 head of cattle and are expecting 200 newborn calves this spring. They also have over 500 acres of cropland or 5,000 acres of cropland and about 500 acres of pasture. They also produce hay, corn grain, corn silage, soybeans, and winter wheat. The Buffalo farm currently has 160 head of buffalo 
and are expecting about 50 new calves this spring. Another production component is the Oneida apple orchard. The orchard normally harvests between 10,000 and 11,000 bushels of apples and serves over 5,000 customers on an annual basis. The Oneida cannery processes the apples into products such as cider, apple chips, and apple sauce. The nation's school system, our nursing home, and food pantry, and local school districts receive our products. Next slide, please. Our next producer is Junhequa, which means life sustenance in our language. It is an all natural organic farm. The mission is to become a successful model of culturally significant, sustainable program that meets the needs, educational and indigenous food needs of our community. Every year, Junhequa plants heirloom white corn, which is harvested and produced by the cannery, by the Oneida cannery. There are high community, there is a high community demand for our products and many families have engaged in developing their own white corn crop to assist providing products to meet the community demand and to feed their families. Just yesterday, we learned that white corn consumption has tripled since the pandemic in March. So we know our community is turning to traditional medicine in an effort to stay healthy. Chinhaqua also cares for 47 grass-fed cattle and about 240 laying hens. Next slide, please. That brings us to processing. In 1978, two Oneida women who were working with our local uh, county on food nutrition for low income families established our own Oneida cannery that has developed into a cultural program commonly referred to as the cannery. The mission of the cannery is to assist community members with preservation methods through traditional and conventional teachings to strengthen self-sufficiency and self-sustainability. They encourage learning through hands-on approach and have community members using our facility to produce their own goods. They teach that food is our medicine and more knowledge, the more knowledge we have with our foods, plant life and medicines allows us to continue to work on Turtle Island. The cannery currently has 25 products with the ability to expand. They work with Junhequa, the Apple Orchard, the Aquaponics and our pantry. Next slide, please. So finally, that brings us to distribution. The Oneida Nation utilizes several ways to distribute the products that we produce. The Oneida uh, Farmer's Market is an opportunity to distribute products to the community. We engage the local farmers and vendors to hold the Farmer's Market weekly throughout the summer months. We also have the Oneida Market, which is a small retail store physically attached to one of our five uh, gas stations, retail outlets, which provides the nation's products that are from Oneida Aquaponics, from the farm, the Buffalo Farm, Junhequa, and the Orchard. So thank you for allowing me to share Oneida Nation's initiatives, and I will see you at the food security breakout session. Yawanko. Thank you so much, Chairman Hill, uh, for that overview of, of what you're doing and, and all of the, the many different activities that uh, Oneida has chosen to engage in under, under the Food Sovereignty Banner that you've, you've worked very systematically to integrate uh, together. Uh, now I wanted to turn to Vanessa Miller, who, as I mentioned, is the public health sanitarian uh, for Oneida. And v Vanessa, based on what the chairman just talked about, it's clear that um, you know, improving community health is a key driver of, of all of the activities that are contained within the Oneida Nations um, Integrated uh, Food Systems Initiative. And one aspect of that, which I think is often overlooked, is the public health issues associated with the production, the packaging, and the delivery of food. Uh, can you tell us uh, about how Oneida is tackling that, that challenge and how you've worked to create you know, laws and governing institutions to, to advance that work? Absolutely. Um, so goodly everyone, my name is Vanessa Miller. I am the tribal sanitarian. Um, so I'm going to be talking today a little bit about how Oneida's self-regulation um, has historically and continues to promote food sovereignty. Um, exactly what was mentioned here by Ian is that um, public health and safe foods is often a component of the system that is overlooked. So a little bit on the history here of how Oneida started our food laws and service codes. 
Next, next slide, please. So Oneida formally adapted our food service code in the year 2000. Um, in that code, the Environmental Health and Safety Division, which now houses the Agricultural Division as well, is listed as the regulatory agency. Um, with that, we are given the authority to license and inspect facilities and programs and services, and then go ahead and issue any type of fines or fees if needed. Um, again, we always promote education first, so those fines and fees type of regulation is definitely a last step. Within this code, um, we reference the quote unquote most current FDA model. So um, the sanitarian back in 2000 had the foresight to insert that within our code. Um, so that way, whenever new science comes out or best available science, time and temperature, biology, laboratory research, changes throughout time, we don't have to go back and amend our code. It changes with the most current FDA code. Um, in addition to that, we then have specific additions and exempt exemptions to fit Oneida community needs. So it's kind of a nice mesh between the science and the research and pathogenic biology and the cultural needs of our community. Um, right within that code, it does immediately say that whenever there is a clash between the Oneida Food Service Code and the inherent quote unquote FDA code, um, Oneida code will always prevail. Um, so that was addressed back then. Um, it's nice because within our code, we do have language that is, um, I don't wanna say open-ended, but is malleable to a changing environment. Um, so for example, we recently passed a cottage food exemption um, in November of just 2020. So that allows entrepreneurs that wish to sell lower risk foods, so foods that don't require time and temperature, um, your foods that can't spoil, so to speak, um, to sell them made from home, as long as they take a food safety class. Um, that is something that we are seeing was a need due to kitchen space, commercial kitchen space. Um, so within that, we are able to address these local entrepreneurs that were wanting to sell their processed white corn, um, their salsas that they went to the canning class and were able to get that education. So um, that was a nice addition there that we, that we were able to get through through our law process to fit a specific need that we were seeing. Next slide, please. So all of this is available via our webpage online. Um, our full code is available on our webpage as well as all of our applications. So it's nice because with, with COVID and the current environment we're living in, um, everything already was pretty much paperless. Um, all fillable forms, vendors can go on our webpage and look at the step-by-step -step process of how to become what type of vendor they're looking to be um, and the steps to go ahead and do that successfully. Next slide, please. And then here is um, our code, the, uh, the first um, introduction, so to speak. And again, incorporating our language and making it culturally relevant to who we are as Oneida people. Next slide, please. So being the regulatory authority here, um, we're charged with licensing and inspecting to make sure that the proper safety measures are in place all with the end goal of um, both promoting food sovereignty and our needs specific to the community, but also one of those needs being keeping our community safe from foodborne illness, um, which again is very underreported and we know that, but those illnesses that are reported are very high numbers. Um, so we do have several different um, levels that we inspect and license here. We do Oneida programs. So we, we go in and, and inspect our school system, our childcare, our workout facilities and fitness centers, as well as our food distribution program and um, emergency pantry as well. Um, we then also sell our license, our for-profit vendors. So that would include our permanent physical establishments, which is our restaurants. Um, our temporary events, so we go through and self-regulate all of our powwows, um, our carnivals, our fests, um, our farmers markets, little pop-up events, things of that nature. Um, and something that's a little bit specific to Oneida here 
It's what we call the independent food vendor operator. So backing up a little bit, this is kind of the type of vendor that actually spurred the creation of our food code. Um, in 2000, we had what we had called the burrito man um, selling burritos throughout the reservation and tribal buildings. So our risk management department kind of recognized that, okay, is there a risk here? What if somebody gets sick? And address that with wanting to require that gentleman to purchase um, insurance, which would have put him out of business. It was, it was too much. It was too costly. So environmental back then said, um, okay, let's, let's take this risk and head it in a preventative way where we educate him with a food safety course and then do routine inspections. And that's how we address that risk. Um, which was approved and went through. And then that's how we formally adapt our food code. Yes, Simon's burritos. <laughs> Infamous Simon's burritos, they're delicious. If you ever get a chance to come up here, you're not gonna taste any, anything else like it, I promise you. Um, next slide, please. So again, all of this is available via our webpage. Um, we can refer people to our webpage, which they really like, especially right now. Um, also, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, we operate everything on the, the same year as far as licensing. So um, our permanent establishments aligns with our independent food vendors um, that are going and selling throughout buildings. Um, so that way we're all on the same on the same track. So we license on our fiscal year basis starting October 1 and then ending September 30th. Um, you can become licensed at any point during the year. Um, we'll just prorate you and figure out that cost there. Um, historically here, we have licensed 55 different restaurants, many of those which remain licensed year after year. Um, independent food vendors, we have seen 25 different community members. Again, many of those that have stayed in business year after year. Um, Simon's is still up and running today, um, successfully, might I add, and is actually in our retail locations. Um, and hundreds of Palo stands, farmers markets, carnivals. Um, our Big Apple Fest has actually grown to have more vendor setups than our Palo currently. Next slide, please. Um, our requirement to become a licensed vendor is to take our night of food safety class. And this is a program and a class that we really take a lot of pride in in Oneida. And that's because we actually set and adhere to higher standards than the state level. Um, so the state level requires restaurants to have a certified food protection manager, um, which is a, I believe it's a serve safe credential and you renew it, I wanna say every five years. Um, with Oneida, it is the not only the same material and code education, but then we go through and we make it culturally, re culturally relevant as well, where we will talk about um, how to cook, you know, the safe temperature to kill the microbials and wild rice, um, things of that nature, um, corn soup, very specific Oneida vendor um, products and requirements. And they go through and they take a renewal every year. So we really pride ourselves on our vendors staying up to date with the most current knowledge, the most current food code, what's happening in um, food safety, all of that nature. Um, we took this course and that was in person um, prior to COVID and we transferred that all online in March. So that way we're not seeing any lapse in credentials at all and people are still able to keep up with their credentials. Next slide, please. So um, jurisdictionally wide, there wise, I should say, there are two counties that overlap with Oneida jurisdiction, um, being Brown County and Outagamie Public Health. Um, that historically and still does kind of provide a unique type of environment, I guess you could say. So originally Oneida's jurisdiction was solely any nation owned and operated service on the reservation. Um, in 2003, we began taking on services in Outagamie Out County that operate within the Oneida boundaries period. So we started actually regulating non-nation citizens at that point. Um, Brown County, there are six nation-owned services that are operating inside nation-owned buildings um, that are dual lap jurisdiction, I guess you could say. So these six vendors are actually dual licensed, which is a, a unique 
opportunity or a unique situation there. Um, however, and this is a little exciting, um, talks just started with Brown County a few weeks ago where there was a non-nation owned business inside one of our retail sites and where Brown County would have normally come in and licensed them in addition to Oneida. Brown County actually said that, you know, this is duplication. Oneida has a valid and legitimate um, food safety program. It doesn't make sense for us to come in. We're not going to. So that was the first time where um, the potential for a dual license came and they opted out. So that's kind of exciting for us to be able to look at the potential for expanded jurisdiction in the future. Next slide, please. And then I'm um, just looking at some exciting things in the future that are coming up. Again, expanding that jurisdiction and program capacity. Um, right now, we have the opportunity to have a sanitarian trainee. So she is a nation citizen and she kind of um, is really doing a lot of hands-on learning and shadowing and, and inspecting with me and with the goal of taking her registered sanitarian exam. So that way the nation has two um, registered sanitarians. Also looking at the possibility of more self-processing capabilities. Um, meat processing plants, as we all know, is something that is very exciting and interesting right now um, due to there being quite a bit of shortage of that. Um, also maybe looking at an assessment of our, our current food code that includes more agricultural self-regulation. Um, we do have very educated staff here. We have three Janhinkwa staff and two environmental staff that went through the Safe Growers Alliance training um, in alliance with the FISMA Modernization Act, um, which was a, a pretty in-depth training, several day training. So we all had went through that as well. Um, our ultimate goal is to have a, our Oneida food safety course recognized off the reservation as well. Um, we have had a case-by-case -case scenario success story where I kind of argued our case, so to speak, um, with a vendor that was looking to sell outside of the nation boundaries. And he had kind of said, hey, I took this course and they taught me you know, just as much, if not more there, why do I have to take another course? Their sanitarian called me, I explained that program and she said, yeah, that does make sense. So having that be a more formal recognition of Oneida's food safety program off the reservation as well. Um, and then again, our cottage food operator exemption just passed in November. So that was very exciting for us. Um, and we just registered our first home operator. Um, I believe she was a, she's a coffee roaster and she had just started advertising herself on social media and she's seeing a lot of positive comments so far. So we're very excited about that as well. And then there's my contact information. If anybody needs any resources or you're looking for any type of um, code or reference or any, any questions at all, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you so much for it, Vanessa. And um, I should mention and remind folks that uh, we, we will be sending a follow-up email to all of you that features uh, the contact information for our panelists uh, today, as well as links to not just the, the food sovereignty case study of Oneida, uh, but also we have a related resources webpage um, that we've been posting in the chat, the link to that, and we will be sharing it in the follow-up email, um, as well as uh, uh, all of these different codes uh, and other key resource links that uh, Vanessa, uh, uh, the chairman, and, and also our next uh, panelists will, will be discussing. Uh, and, and also I wanted to remind folks, if you do have a, a question, go ahead and post it in the, uh, in the chat and Q&A. Um, we have a couple already lined up, which we'll get to after we hear from our next panelists. And we also hear from our case study author for a few minutes. Um, but I wanted to turn the floor over now to uh, Jesse. And um, uh, Jesse, you, you, uh, you're food service director with the United Nations School District. And I know we're getting a little bit of feedback on your connection. Um, but was was curious to get your perspective on on get how how the nation is getting healthy foods into the school system is ensuring that um, these healthy foods that Oneida is producing are actually consumed by Oneida citizens in particular youth um, and if you can shed some light on how that process works 
um, provide you know, some detail about Oneida's award-winning uh, farm to school program and how and what sort of challenges you've encountered with, with establishing and growing that program and, and how you've worked to overcome them. Well, I'm not sure exactly where to start, but um, we have incorporated in our curriculum here in Oneida Nation Schools um, programs that are monitored and managed and uh, taught by our language and culture department. Um, that includes um, taste testing, it includes uh, seed uh, planting in the spring, um, which will be transferred into the school garden. Um, and it's a hands-on program that the uh, students learn firsthand how to um, grow food. Um, and it's, it's very heartwarming to see their faces light up when, the, uh, when we explain to them that something that we put in a, in a recipe that we're serving to them their faces light up and, and they know that they participated in the production of it. So um, it's, it's an important part of our educational program. Um, I wanted to start by uh, explaining um, some of the uh, committees that we have or a committee that we have here in Oneida Nation. Um, it's called the Oneida Community Integrated Food Systems. Um, it, uh, the members include a number of stakeholders on the reservation and within those uh, Wisconsin Oneida Nation um, tribal members. We, uh, we have uh, uh, as members, uh, the uh, Oneida Nation Farms, the Jen Hankwa that uh, Chairman Hill mentioned, uh, the Apple Orchard, the Oneida Retail uh, Segment, uh, the Oneida Nation Aquaponics and the Emergency Food Pantry. Um, and of course, the Oneida Nation School System. Uh, we meet on a monthly basis. Uh, we had been meeting in person up until March. Uh, we have had virtual meetings since then. Um, our most recent would what it was last uh, yesterday, Wednesday. Um, the uh, uh, we are also members of the Wisconsin uh, Farm School Network, the Intertribal Agricultural Council, uh, and a group here in Northeast Wisconsin called Wello. Uh, which is an umbrella group that links local farmers with a number of school systems in the area. Um, we have also contributed to the uh, traditional foods publication in cooperation with the Wisconsin Department of Public Instructions, where uh, we created a, um, a, a booklet, uh, a toolkit, if you will, uh, to help other um, tribal nations within the Wisconsin uh, borders to uh, bring traditional foods to their uh, to their kitchens and their cafeterias. Um, one of the one of our uh, contributions was the uh, uh, corn soup that we that we enjoy so much here. Um, going back to uh, what um, Chairman Hill mentioned earlier with regard to the uh, Angus beef and the buffalo, uh, we established the intertribal purchase order system. Uh, where we can uh, order uh, beef and buffalo from Oneida Nation farms, have it processed and delivered to the schools uh, for use in our cafeterias. Uh, we have a number of recipes that we have been uh, uh, using. Uh, we're mixing 50% uh, buffalo with 50% black egg as beef and uh, creating uh, different recipes with those, with those products. Uh, we're also able to order um, uh, apples. As a matter of fact, we just finished our last order uh, with the apple orchard in uh, late December, and uh, that was the uh, Jonathan variety. But um, they, we can start purchasing from the apple orchard as early as August when uh, when our schools open. And um, as I, as I mentioned, we have a five month window that we're able to make these purchases with. Um, As uh, Chairman Hill had mentioned, uh, we have uh, available to us through the June Hankwa uh, Oneida Nationwide Corn Grass Fed Shorthorn Beef, which is the only um, shorthorn beef program in Wisconsin. And uh, we're very happy that that's now going to become available uh, for purchase from June Hankwa. Um, they also raise a variety of uh, fruits and vegetables. 
for us uh, that we use in um, in school system on our salad bar um, and also is processed um, so that we can uh, serve things um, serve some of their products in the uh, in the um, school cafeterias um, we also have our aquaponics program which uh, we're very very happy and proud of um, we uh, received a national award from the Intertribal Agricultural Council uh, for um, uh, our avant-garde um, position uh, where other uh, tribes and other school systems are uh, can come to Oneida, learn about um, how the process started, what the total process from start to finish of how the uh, uh, seedlings are planted, grown, nurtured, and and uh, and harvested. Uh, we also have uh, a number of uh, tilapia that grows within the tanks that feed uh, the uh, that that feed the plants so that they can uh, have the nutrition that they need. And the aquaponics project has been a big eye opener uh, in that uh, our our growing season here in Wisconsin is pretty short, so uh, we have to take advantage of every every opportunity to. Uh, keep those keep that program going. Um, uh, the Oneida Nation school system, part of the uh, curriculum that we have here is incorporating our language and culture departments and they teach students um, through our school gardens how to um, plant seeds, uh, nurture uh, small plants, and then they are transferred into the school garden so that they can be grown for consumption in our cafeterias. It's not a big provider of what it is we uh, what we consume in the cafeterias, but it is important that uh, our children learn um, the methodology um, and and how they can take that knowledge home to their families and nurture their own gardens. Um, I think that pretty much wraps it up for what I what I intended to share but uh, if there I'm open to questions if anybody has something they'd like to ask thank you so much Jesse yeah we have we have three uh, questions in the uh, in the in the chat here and um, uh, we'll get to those in just a moment I did want to um, if we can go to the next slide please I did want to uh, now turn it over the floor to uh, my colleague Ryan Seelaw um, who is the uh, author uh, of the case study, worked very closely with uh, the panelists and many other folks at the United Nations that are working on various aspects of this integrated initiative. I uh, want him to share for a few minutes about uh, the transferable lessons and strategies that, um, that we drew out of our engagement with Oneida and what, what they have to offer in terms of uh, advice and guidance to other tribes that are either looking to establish food sovereignty approaches or or grow approaches that they've already created and um, this is a standard um, component of all of NCI's case studies is to feature five or six uh, short uh, summaries of what we feel um, are the most um, the most beneficial pieces of a particular tribe's approach and what they mean for other tribes so with that I'll turn it over to you Ryan Ian, um, as Ian mentioned, when we're writing these case studies, you know, we're not simply trying to um, just, it's not simply a show and tell of the good things that the tribe is doing, um, but also to try and have some lessons that might be transferable or usable in other contexts. And I'm going to try and go through a couple of these quickly, um, so if there's more time for Q&A, but they are all in the case study, um, and you can read about them there in a little bit more you know, expansive fashion. Um, next slide, please. Um, but so the first lesson we sort of want to talk about that came away from our experience with Oneida is we call institutionalizing integration. And you've heard a lot about this today. Um, Chairman Hill talked about this definitely in his PowerPoint uh, presentation. And it's, you know, when you think of food sovereignty and exercising control over food systems, that's a very large uh, task, right? A, it's a huge scope. You have different components of it. Uh, many tribal nations have the various components in operation, uh, but they may be operating in sort of a silo effect or where they're just sort of focused on their in, you know, their one piece, um, but not necessarily thinking larger scale or how they can work together. And one of the things that the United Nation has done over the past um, you know, three decades 
is something uh, that Jesse talked about, which is they've actually institutionalized some efforts to integrate all of their systems. One of those being the Oneida Community Integrated Food Systems, OSIPS, um, which is, as Jesse talked about, is a body where people from different, ask, from different stakeholders from around uh, the tribal nation can actually talk together and, and address some of these issues together. Um, they've also created uh, you know, another institutional piece where they've hired a, an OSIFS coordinator, a person whose position, a permanent position, whose, whose job description and title is to help facilitate that dialogue to look forward for programs, opportunities, initiatives, grants, whatever it might be, um, ways to, to grow control over the food systems. And so that's kind of what we're talking about with institutionalizing integration, and that's some of the ways that they've done it. Um, Next slide, please. Yeah, so an, another transferable lesson um, that came from our time with Oneida was this idea of empowering community ownership and agency. And uh, when I was interviewing you know, lots of people and I was interviewing them at the Oneida Nation, talked about how the government can't do everything and really that the it's not the government's role to do everything in the food systems. Um, and that actually, there, if you want the community to be healthier, you want the community to have buy-in and participation and that they are be going to be doing some of the work. Um, it also frees up sometimes government resources to do other things when the community is involved in some of those efforts. And so Oneida has taken a real uh, approach where they, um, you know, are, they're aware that the government isn't going to control and do everything, um, but that they can do things to empower community members um, in this space. There's a couple examples mentioned in the case study. I'll just mention one that was briefly referenced, and that's with this uh, a group called the White Corn Growers Association, which is a community group um, that is trying to grow, you know, traditional white corn. They're trying to improve um, the quality of it, increase the number of the seeds. Um, but they've had some, you know, some actions by the government to help them along um, in terms of land usage, in terms of um, using some of the equipment from the Oneida Nation's farm to make that land. Um, you know, better plowable, growable. Um, it's just one example uh, of several that are mentioned in the case study about how you can empower your citizens to kind of fill some of these spaces and, and make a, a more elaborate system or more elaborate control over a food system. Uh, next slide, please. Um, another thing we took away from the United Nation was this idea of pervasive and sustained education. I think this is something that everyone knows on some level that if you wanna change how people are acting um, change their habits, that you need to change their mindset, and that there's an education component involved in that. Um, but one thing that we you know, saw in talking to people the other night is, is sort of the long-term constant education that's going on with respect to healthy eating, healthy living, food systems. And that's everything from uh, what Jesse was talking about, you know, curriculum in the school system to community events, um, like the Husking Bee, like the Apple Fest, where there's an opportunity for the community to interact with healthy foods, to learn about them, um, to even just informational pamphlets, health, you know, things at the health center, uh, classes, those types of things that are providing uh, continuous education, trying to reach all sectors of the community um, so that that mindset can change over time. Next slide, please. Um, a fourth sort of transferable lesson or strategy that we took away um, is this idea of prioritizing access to healthy foods. And this again is something that has been talked about um, by all three panelists. So, you know, it's one thing to produce healthy foods. Uh, it's another thing to say, you know, to work on sort of the healthy lifestyle portion of things, but um, the people need to have access to the foods um, if they're going to, if there's going to be a change, right? It has to be somewhat easy for them to do. Um, and this is done in the school context that Jesse talked about quite a bit, um, where you know fresh produce, um, the meats and things are coming to the school, um, so there's access in that capacity. Something that wasn't mentioned, I don't think, today, but that's in the case study is also talking about how the Oneida Nation's uh, care facility, nursing care facility, does a similar thing where they have uh, local produced native healthy foods that are being served to their elders, um, and then. As Chairman Hill mentioned, you have uh, things like the Oneida Market, which is a place where people know they can go to. It's in a convenient location. They know where they can find the, these foods. They know where they can find the traditional foods, uh, the locally grown foods from um, in their area so that they have access to those foods um, on a regular basis. Um, obviously, the cannery, which was talked about, plays into that too because it allows you access for longer periods of time because um, it preserves the food for longer periods of time and that sort of thing also fits into that same idea. Next slide, please. 
And then finally, an, another big takeaway was this idea we saw, you know, time and time again that the Oneida Nation and their efforts um, are making value-based decisions. Um, their, their decision to take control of the food systems allows them to make value-based decisions. Um, and so I'm just gonna give two quick examples. One, which is discussed in the case study, but wasn't really talked about a lot today, is in the area of um, water reclamation or, or in land reclamation, where they've been trying to heal the waterways and heal the land um, from pollution that had happened decades and decades ago um, in order to bring back fish, which was a you know, traditional component of the Oneida diet, in order to bring back the wild rice, um, which is starting to come back with wetland restoration. Um, so that, those are value decisions in, in choosing to do that, um, but also the manner in which it has been done at Oneida fits into their values. And so they're using processes that sometimes are more expensive, sometimes are longer, they take longer timeframes to actually operate. Um, but it, they have other advantages um, and they also fit in with the cultural values of, of taking care of the land and the air and the water. Um, that's something that Odai Nation has been able to do by acting in this space. Um, another example would be the aquaponics um, bay, the decision to use the, you know, the lettuces that are grown there to go to the school system. Um, those lettuces could be, have turned, you know, they could turn those and sell them on the open market, uh, perhaps in Green Bay or other local areas possibly for more money, um, but that's, you know, the, the value in those from the United Nations perspective is not getting those healthy foods to the youth and to the, you know, the, the next generation, get them used to those things. And that, again, it's just another example, and there's a few more in the case study that we talk about, um, but this idea of, of, this is really what food sovereignty is all about, right? It's acting, uh, taking control over all of these aspects so that you can control the decision-making processes, you can control what's happening, and you can make sure they align with your cultural values and what you want to happen. Um, and so that's sort of the last you know, big takeaway I'm going to mention. Um, and we can read more about them in the actual case study. Thank you so much, Ryan. Really appreciate it. And thank you for your work on, on putting this together. You know, one of the, uh, one of the unfortunate uh, aspects of doing this work, a uh, few unfortunate aspects, is you learn so much great information about the extraordinary work that Oneida and other tribes are doing in this area. And you got to try to cram it all into roughly about 3,000 words. And it's, it never does the story full justice. But we hope that you know this case study and the other ones that we're releasing at least give people the basics about the, the different approaches these tribes are taking. And then, and then, and then folks you know, here uh, attending the webinar and others across any country can take it upon themselves to engage with the, these tribes directly to learn uh, more of the minute detail about, about not just what they're doing, but mo more importantly, how they're doing it and how their approaches and their processes and their systems can be um, not, you know, replicated wholesale, but, you know, certain pieces taken and remolded and re-customized re and refashioned to, you know, by other tribes to fit their particular uh, values, their particular priorities and their particular uh, needs. So, uh, with that, we wanted to turn to the to the Q and A and the time we have remaining. And I, it does not appear we we have a very engaged group today. It does not appear we'll be able to get to all of these questions, but I, I'll cherry pick a few. And what we'll do is we'll we'll follow up with the panelists uh, to get answers on any questions that were not shared uh, during the webinar, uh, and and provide you those answers in a follow up email. Uh, but the first one um, the first one deals with with COVID and. Um, wanted uh this is shared by um clayton and uh he you know he's curious about what I, what i mentioned at the outset that you know that food security uh ha has been laid bare and food insecurity has been laid bare during the COVID pandemic and uh he's curious to learn more, a little bit more from the panelists about how has oneida responded to the COVID 19 pandemic how has it ensured uh food security given uh you know, the, the likely impacts on the community, like, you know, increased unemployment uh, and, and so forth. So I'll just open it up to the floor if any of the panelists want to respond to that. Yes, thank you for the question. It's uh, Chairman Dehasa Hill. Um, I guess generally through the pandemic, uh, we did see an uptick. Uh, we do run uh, a food, food uh, distribution program, uh, the federal program for Dipper. And also we have our, our I guess, uh, tribally supported um, uh, food pantry. And so those were kind of the two main, I guess, hubs to make sure that our community members were being, uh, had the food they need for, the, for themselves and their families. Uh, there was 
uh, through the food pantry, we had several connections with larger organizations like Feeding America and those, uh, those distributions that were done, I guess, regionally. And so um, through our work uh, with, with the food pantry, being able to organize uh, those kind of drive through pickups of food. So there was uh, very little contact between uh, personnel and the community. Uh, we did have very large lines. Um, so obviously our police department also had to assist with traffic as well. And uh, as I mentioned in, in my slide that there was, uh, you know, a three times uh, increase in, in con consumption of our Oneida white corn. And so I guess we're very fortunate that in the last uh, couple of years, we've had some pretty good um, production from both uh, uh, our Junhaqua farm with the white corn and then our pretty uh, sustained um, production of beef and buffalo through the Oneida Nation farm. But then also, as mentioned, the white corn growing group also in the community who don't necessarily uh, sell their corn, but they, they barter. So we're kind of bringing back some of that traditional economy as well, where, you know, that was a large part of the Iroquois Confederacy was uh, the food trade. And so we were uh, pretty extensive uh, farmers. And so we had a lot of food to trade and, uh, you know, you, you can only eat it. So you can only eat so much and the rest you know, should be uh, distributed. And so um, you know, I'm, I'm very thankful that we were able to get through this uh, pandemic thus far uh, without uh, too much um, um, not being able to meet that need in our community. So I'm very glad for all of the staff that continued to work through the pandemic and making sure that we had safety procedures in place uh, for that community contact and being able to distribute that food safely in our community. But yeah, there was a very large uptick in the need um, for that as we went through large layoffs as well um, uh, earlier this spring and slowly we're able to, as the economy start to turn around, um, being able to hire uh, the majority of those uh, employees back to full employment. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. I don't know if Jesse or Vanessa wanted to respond to that question as well. All right. Well, yes, Jesse. Well, um, the uh, I have to give a big shout out to the Oneida Nation School System Food Service staff. Uh, they have been continuously uh, preparing two meals per day for distribution in an on-contact fashion, um, transitioning from a, a sit-down in-service um, program to a non-contact program. Um, took a, took took quite a uh, an effort. And uh, again, they've been working nonstop um, for almost a full year. Um, not going to say there were no complaints, but uh, they're very happy to have been acknowledged for the work that they're doing. And they'll continue to do. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, I wanted to turn to a question now. Um, I believe both of these would be probably for Vanessa. Um, um, Vanessa, the, the first one deals with uh, federal inspection. So are the cannery and, and uh, pardon me if I get the pronunciation wrong, but um, Shunhequa uh, farms subject to federal inspection or does Oneida inspect those? And then uh, a related question about um, conflicts between traditional food handling and preparation practices and public health codes. So if you can shed some light on those, we'd, we'd appreciate it. Sure. Um, so that first question there, um, Jinhinkwa is not subject to federal inspection. Um, we do house that expertise and ag expertise in-house. Um, they used to be certified organic, so they would undergo that certification inspection. They no longer are. Um, and actually something very exciting that they are pursuing is an indigenously grown certification um, that is much stricter higher standards that and responsibilities that we have always um, and the staff had always adhered to, but now making it more formal. Um, the cannery is subject to FDA because they are a cannery um, processor. 
Um, so they do undergo those inspections because we do not have an FDA cannery inspector in-house. Um, however, again, um, the cannery actually has higher standards even for ourselves that we uphold than what is, I guess, quote unquote, regulated upon them. So you'll often see that on the case um, internally with Oneida with our self-regulation, -regula which I think sometimes is a misconception when you hear self-regulation, that people think it's a way to, I guess, quote unquote, get out of regulation. And it's really not. It's a way to fit your specific needs with a specific um, tailored response which we do have higher standards for ourselves in many instances. So for the cannery example, um, FDA requires a pH of 4.6 or lower. The cannery actually goes above and beyond that and they don't put anything on the shelf that's 4.0 or, or, or higher. Um, so again, recognizing that we do live and serve a higher risk population and community and tailoring our requirements to that, which we know we can, we can fit and accomplish. Um, that second question there, um, has Vanessa experienced any conflicts between traditional food handling preparation and public health codes? Um, I don't wanna say conflicts, but sometimes there's a lack of mention of a process within the FDA code. So basically that is when, again, Oneida Food Service Code um, takes premacy and we work with the um, producer or processor to come up with a uh, um, safe way of something happening. For example, using wood ash for our white corn, um, we had processors wanna take that and accept that from community members. So we have them track it. We have them track it and they sign something that says um, this wasn't contaminated wood, it doesn't have gas on it, anything of that nature. Um, so that way, if there is something that were occur, we could go back and do some type of product recall. Thank you so much, Vanessa. That's, that's a lot of great insight. And I, I imagine uh, there's many folks that are attending this webinar that might have more technical uh, detailed questions that they would wanna dive into with you once they take a look at your code and, and, and all of this, all of the stuff that goes with it. Um, we are out of time and we have a lot more questions. Like I mentioned, we are, we'll, we'll get those answered for you uh, by engaging with the panelists after we wrap up here today and we'll send you those answers in a follow-up email. Um, I did want to um, mention to you that uh, we, we are recording uh, this webinar and so um, probably in about the next week or so, we'll be uploading this to NCAI's YouTube channel. And um, we will be including a link to the webinar recording, as well as the uh, Oneida case study, the Oneida um, case study resource webpage, and also um, other, other information that, that uh, the Tribal Food Sovereignty Advancement Initiative and resources that we have to offer, um, as well as the answers to the questions that, we're not, that we didn't get time to, um, to delve into today. Um, so with that, I, I wanted to um, just show you in the last slide here, um, some contact information for our staff here. If you wanna learn more uh, about our, the initiative or the case study specifically, uh, there's the, the email addresses for Sadie and for Ryan. And I uh, wanted to, to, to close by thanking um, on behalf of NCAI, our panelists, um, uh, Chairman Hill, uh, Vanessa Miller, Jesse Padron, and, um, and all of you for attending today. And please be on the lookout for our next uh, case study webinar launch, which will be in a couple of weeks time. And uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks so much.